take some steps to get to know them a little better. The church is only as friendly as you are. Next, prepare your heart to experience God today. The Holy Spirit is more excited to be here than you are. He certainly came ready today, so tune into what He wants to do in and through you. You're going to experience God today. You can also join a life group, promoting healthy relationships for our families as we laugh, grow, and serve together. There's a complete list of life groups on our website and at the Welcome Center in the back. They meet throughout the week here in this building at our South Campus and in homes around and in the Lansing area. That's a great next step in having healthy relationships here. If you're a parent, your child will love Journey Kids. Our children's gathering is designed specifically for birth through sixth grade, for your children to grow in the wonder of God and share his love with others. We also have a nursery available and a nursing mother's room in the back, so you don't have to miss any part of our gathering. First Wednesday is a gathering focused on our core value of understanding the Bible, where we go deep into God's word and teaching. We receive communion every first Wednesday, worship and pray together. And there's experience for both kids and students to participate, all taking place on, yep, you guessed it, first Wednesday of every month. Saturate Revival is on the second Sunday night of the month at 6 p.m. This gathering is dedicated to bringing all ages into the powerful moving of the Holy Spirit. Dinner for purchase is available from our cafe at 5 p.m. You and your family will experience God in even more obvious ways at our Saturate Revival Nights. If you're a student in 6th through 12th grade, we have real-life student ministries every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. at our JLC South Campus, just two miles down the street. Go there for games, food, friends, exciting music, teaching, and small groups. That's really the place to be for teenagers. We believe you can leave high school and head into young adults hearing and knowing the voice of God in your life. If you're newer to Journey, we invite you to our welcome party on the fourth Sunday of the month. We'll feed you, you'll get to know the church, the staff, and have some fun, I promise. If you haven't been to the welcome party yet, this is your next step. Thank you so much for coming to experience our Sunday morning gathering. If you have any questions or prayer needs, don't hesitate to ask a pastor, someone from our Connections team, or stop by the Welcome Center. gathering is about ready to start, so if you're in the cafe, please make your way in. If at any point you have questions about what's happening here at Journey Life Church, don't hesitate to ask a pastor, a Connections team member, or stop by the Welcome Center. We'd love to connect with you. If you're a parent, we have an incredible children's ministry where your kid will enjoy a time in God's presence tailored just for them. You can be certain that your child is safe, loved, having fun, and experiencing God while you're here in the main gathering. Also, if your child is with you and gets restless, we do have a nursing mother's room in the back so you don't have to miss any part of the gathering. It's our heartfelt belief that from the moment you arrive in our parking lot to the Spirit-led with God here, and your life will be better because of Him. So get ready to come at least one step closer to God today. God bless and enjoy the gathering. and just posture your hearts ready to receive from the Lord tonight. Thank you, Jesus. the cross upon your back bleeding until your final breath a king of blood a crown of thorns you paid it all
place that changed history. Nails in your hands, the hands that saved me. The grave was sealed, and death lost its sting. Changed history, the nails in your hands, the hands that saved me. The grave was sealed, and death was sitting as the lion roared in victory. Oh, the cross, what you've done, it was more than enough, more than enough. Oh, the cross. 
of gratitude today. We just want to say thank you. We just want to say thank you, Jesus. What you did was more than enough. We didn't deserve your sacrifice, but you gave it anyway. So we just say thank you tonight. I just want us to sing that, oh, the cross one more time. And oh, the cross, what you've done, it was more than Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Just as we were preparing for our Good Friday gatherings, the Lord really put on my heart this old hymn. And so I would just invite you to enter into the Lord's presence as we sing about the blood tonight. And what can wash
that we're singing about, that now is your moment. He's here and he wants to meet you. He wants you to know that he cares so deeply about you, that his love for you is so great, that he went to the cross for you. Thank you, Jesus. I just sense that so deeply that someone in the room tonight needs to know Jesus for the very first time and he's ready and waiting and wanting to meet you in this moment. We say yes to you tonight, Jesus. That you are beautiful, that you are wonderful, all the things that we're singing about. And we receive everything that you have for us today. Thank you, Jesus. I just want us to sing out those words one more time, just the voices as an anthem, because he's alive, he's risen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Sing, death could not hold you. And death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. Silence the boss of sin and grave. And the heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have, you have no rival. Yes. You Jesus, tonight, we recognize you as Lord. We give you honor, the honor that you're due, God. We bless you and we thank you, God, for the sacrifice that you've made. We thank you for your love for us, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen, amen. Well, welcome. We're so glad you're here with us tonight. Jesus is here in the room with us. And so I would just invite you to go ahead, turn around to the person next to you, tell them something that Jesus is doing in your life. We'll be back in just a moment.
Let's make our way back to our... Let's make... Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. Good. Hello. Hi. Good, good Friday. Good happy Friday. Can you hear me? I don't think so. I'm trying, but I feel like it should amplify me. What's that? We'll try this guy. Good Friday evening to you all. So glad to see you guys. Man, church on a Friday night's fun, huh? I'm digging it. I'm liking it. All right, if this is your very first time here at Journey Life Church, we just want to welcome you. Um, we're so glad that you chose this evening to spend and this place to spend your Good Friday with us. So if you look at the seat pocket in front of you, you'll see something called um, a connection card. If you fill that out, take it back to the Welcome Center after the gathering. We have a gift for you. Plus, we would love to meet you in person if we haven't already. Also in the seat pocket in front of you, you'll see two cards. One of them is a prayer request card. If you need prayer and you want people to be praying with you, uh, we have an incredible prayer team. Team, staff, board, we all pray over these as they come in every week, and we are seeing God move because that's what he does. And so if you um, also, um, amazing things are happening. If you're seeing these uh, prayer requests um, happening, uh, there are Cheryl Win cards in the seat pocket in front of you as well. Fill that out and let us know so we can rejoice with you, um, and it's going to be good. So make sure you do that. All three cards can also, um, they can be taken back to the Welcome Center afterwards, and they can be filled out online at journeylifechurch.com as well. I have to get my glasses out. That's real. That's real. So guys, Easter's almost here, right? Sunday, 31st, it's coming up. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the single most significant event in the history of the world. Amen. Every culture and people group on the planet have benefited because God raised Jesus from the dead. But his resurrection isn't just for the world. It's for you. It's for your family. It's for your friends. And your world is changed the most by Jesus' resurrection. So join us in coming back to life. See what I did there? We're coming back to life because that's the name of the next series. It's starting on Sunday. Back to life. I love the name of that. I think that's awesome. We're starting that new sermon series on Easter Sunday. And what you can expect on Sunday is your kids and Journey Kids, they're going to play some fun Easter games. Uh, they're going to hear the Easter story. They're going to have a fun treat bag to bring home with them. And adults, we have some fun things happening too. We're going to have some cool uh, creative elements happening in the gathering as well. Uh, we're going to have a tree and a jelly bean bar, which is what I'm pretty excited about. I was going to say the most, but I shouldn't say that because the message about Jesus' resurrection, way more important than the jelly beans. For sure, for sure. I caught myself there. So be excited. Um, it's gonna be a it's a, gonna be a wonderful, wonderful Sunday morning Easter at Journey Life Church. Um, did you know that Easter is the the uh, how do we say this? More people come to church on Easter Sunday than any other Sunday um, throughout the year. Did you know that? So. That means you should be inviting people because if they're going to come, this is the Sunday they're going to come, especially people that aren't coming regularly. So, you know, they're probably, they're literally just waiting. They're waiting for you to ask them. Honestly, they might not know it yet, but they're waiting for, for you to ask them. So make sure that you invite family and friends. We'll be back here Sunday morning at 9 and 11 a.m. Up next, uh, we always want to give an opportunity to give anytime we get together. Um, so if you guys do want to give, we have boxes on the two back walls where after the gathering, um, you can slip uh, your gift in there. So Father God, we just ask that you would uh, bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
All throughout this week, uh, God has been intensely impressing upon me to identify with the sufferings of Jesus. And uh, that's led me to listening to, of course, the last week of Jesus' life scriptures, like I challenged you guys to do a third of the Gospels make up the, the last week of Jesus' life. Uh, and it's led me to also, God specifically directed me to watch the Passion of the Christ movie um, with my two older kids as well, my, my wife and two older kids, introducing them to it. And it's the first time they've seen it. It's only the third time I've seen it. I saw it in theaters. We saw it when we bought the DVD and on Tuesday night. And um, identifying with the sufferings of Jesus has wrecked me in a very specific way. <laughs> One way is I've realized how light and momentary my sufferings are. Now, Jesus understands that. Like, he understands that we didn't go through the depth of suffering quite as deep as he did. He understands that we didn't carry the weight of the whole world. He understands that we didn't carry the sin of the whole world. Okay? But he also understands that you and I experience depth of emotion and height of emotion in the same manner, no matter what we're going through. And so you can be sure that no matter what you've gone through, Jesus understands you, okay? And the sufferings that you've been through are light and momentary compared to how Jesus went through and the grace with which he went through those things. And we're going to learn how to walk through those things well tonight. This is a beautiful, beautiful night. It's Good Friday for a reason. There is a call for us to understand suffering right now in the spiritual realm. In fact, I've actually had seven separate words from God this week on that. <laughs> Three to me personally in my spirit, different types of confirmations. Four from other individuals. Diane was one of them here. here. Um, and and a one was this morning, in fact, before the noon gathering. Uh, to make, you know, seven, that's an important, that's a complete number in the Bible. That's a big number. That's good. Um, we need to identify with the sufferings of Jesus and the cross and learn how to do that well because it's not so that we invite more suffering. Let me be clear. It's so that we invite the greater victory that's available on the other side of suffering. We're going to dive in. All right, John 19, verse 1. Um, dive in quick. Here we go. It says, Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. We'll be in John 19 the whole night, so just hang there. 19, verse 1. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. As we watched the Passion of the Christ, that was one of the most intense moments for me. And they purposed in that movie, by the way, to show us every bit of the beating, every piece of the hits that would take to get him to be unrecognizable as the scripture describes he was. And, and so that's, that was their purpose. That's why you see kind of this like intensity of the suffering. They clothed him in purple, verse three, and went up to him again and again saying, hail king of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to him, here is the man. And as soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted we have a law. And according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. This is a false statement by the chief priests and the Jewish leaders. That is not actually a punishment worthy of death in the Jewish Old Testament law or in the Mishnah or in the Midrash. Claiming to be the son of God is not punishable by, by death. It's not a capital punishment, crime. Neither is uh, claiming to be the Messiah, falsely claiming to be the Messiah. It's not punishable by death. They are lying. They're gaslighting their Roman governor, seeing if they can pull a fast one on him because he doesn't know necessarily all of the details of the Jewish law to be able to call their bluff but basically backfires on them. P 
Pilate sees through it. He probably has some advisors who helped him along with that. But he also sees Jesus as more powerful than this. Check, check this out, verse 8. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. He sees Jesus as more credible than them and the, the accusations they're bringing against him. In the middle of this foray, in the middle of this mess, he went back inside the palace. Verse, this is verse, verse 9. Where do you come from, he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, do you, don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. Now, this is the ultimate evil hypocrisy <laughs> on the part of the chief priests here. They are playing the part of loyal subjects to Caesar when every last one of them to a man sees Caesar and Roman rule as the primary evil in their world. Okay? They, they want him thrown off. They want him defeated. They want the Jewish nation reestablished. They are simply lying to manipulate and control the governor to get what they want and continue to hold their death grip on power. Pure evil. Verse 13. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is called Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked, we have no king but Caesar. The chief priests answered. Now think about this. They're accusing Jesus of blasphemy, and here they are blaspheming. That's what they're doing. The chief priests themselves are denying the kingship of God. We have no king but Caesar. Meanwhile, even Caesar himself recognized the kingship of the gods in the, in the Roman pantheon. <laughs> so they were, the, like, Pilate knew they were just being dumb in this case. The chief priests are manipulating. They're, they have this end justifies the means kind of attitude about this. They don't value truth. They don't value integrity at all. And so the question is, how do you handle someone who has no value for truth or integrity and is willing to openly cheat and manipulate in order to win? Well, first of all, don't stoop to their level. Keep your integrity. Secondly, Pray for God to keep you. So praying that God will keep you doesn't mean that God will always keep you safe. Amen. <laughs> I mean, you haven't read this story right here if you believe that. <laughs> okay? Sometimes it does. Sometimes it means that um, praying will keep you safe so that you can live to fight another day. Sometimes it means that praying for God to keep you will keep you in the center of his will, which is sometimes right in the fire. Okay? And, and this is Passion Week. This is, this is kind of one of the main messages of this week. Right? But keep your integrity in that process. That is a non-negotiable. Without that, your prayers are diluted. Your prayers are, are not are not hitting right. They're not flowing right. Stay truth-filled. Stay full of integrity. Don't operate in manipulation. The end does not justify the means. Paul said it this way, why not ba rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Amen. Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. I'm not saying that we have to just take it. Look, there are just wars. There are reasons to fight back at times, but we do have to fight back primarily and first with our weapons as Christians, as believers that are different from our world's weapons. 
2 Corinthians 10, 4, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and to make it obedient to Christ. So here are our weapons in prayer. One, spirit-led prayers. Ephesians 6, 18, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. If you're a believer, part of your inheritance, one of the things that you need to continually grow in is continuing to get your finger on God's pulse and learning how to pray in harmony with the Holy Spirit of God and pray in harmony with Jesus, who are both uh, with the Father mediating for us. Okay? And when we pray in harmony with them, our prayers become more effective. So learning how to pray with God um, and not at God <laughs> is, is one of the key uh, skill sets in the Christian life. And it's one that, you know, I'm just going to keep learning better and better until I die. That's just how it's going to work. I'm gonna, that's the one I'm going to keep growing at for the rest of my life. It's not the kind of thing that I'm ever going to feel like I've arrived at, but I think there's a glory to glory kind of moment with prayer. So spirit-led prayers is our, one of our weapons. Second, worship. Psalm 149.6 says this, May the praise of God be in their mouths and a double-edged sword in their hands. Amen. Now, worship is a powerful weapon. It has maybe slightly been a little overemphasized recently because it's been written into so many worship songs. Worship is my weapon. You know, it's like, it's like there's a lot of them. The reason I, but the, and the only reason I say that is um, because some of the other weapons that we use for spiritual warfare are emphasized in scripture. They're declared to be weapons. Worship is primarily to usher you into the presence of God. So our first motive in worship is not to go to war. Our first motive in worship is to be with God, to glorify him, to make him look good. Okay. And then, and then the warfare kind of thing can come around sometimes when it's under the unction of the Holy Spirit when the Spirit is inspiring that. Okay, so, but there are some other weapons like Spirit-led prayer and this next one, the Word of God, that are primary weapons in the Spirit. The Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. It's a primary offensive weapon that we use. It is impossible, I think, to overemphasize this one as a weapon that we use, Amen. all right? The written Word of God and the Word's spoken by God to you or through someone else to you, okay? Um, and and I, I would say it's hard to overemphasize it. It can be done maybe. Um, there's a group of people who kind of like to think of it as Father, Son, and Holy Bible. That's not actually what the Trinity is. It is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Yeah. So we still have to be led by the Spirit, but the Word of God is what grounds us. The Word of God is the filter through which we know that we're hearing from God. The Word of God is our foundation, right? It's our rule of life and practice. It's God's love letter to us. It's his roadmap for our lives, and it is the sword of the Spirit. Jesus used it when he was uh, in the temptation with the devil, right? He used the Word of God. He used his sword. Next, the blood of the lamb. In Revelation 12, 11, we see that. This one was um, maybe overemphasized between 30 and 40 years ago when I, I would hear a lot of people plead the blood yeah. in situations where it necessarily didn't belong and it sounded like they were trying to use a magical you know, statement to kind of manipulate God. And Amen. if it goes there, that's really not the thing. Yeah. That's not how it's being used in Revelation 12. Um, the blood, identifying with the blood of Jesus is identifying with the suffering of Jesus. It's identifying with the fact that his blood, when God looks at us, he sees the blood of his son. Instead of seeing our sin, we are hidden with Christ in God. Identifying with the blood of Jesus means that we get washed clean from sin and we don't have, we're not identified by our sin anymore. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I was a sinner. I have been saved by grace. Now I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. That's what the blood of Jesus means. 
right? That's who you are as a believer. That's your inheritance, okay? And so you fight with the blood of Jesus to be that who God's called you to be, who is the righteousness of God in Christ. You're seated with him in heavenly realms. That's a weapon. Then the other weapon that's mentioned in scripture in Revelation 12, 11 is the word of your testimony. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. So this is a powerful and I would say uh, demonstrably under, underused weapon Amen. in the body of Christ. Your testimony is not just about you. It's about the people around you. If you use your testimony well, it's gonna affect people for eternity. Yeah. If you steward your testimony well, Right, the others around you are going to be influenced to move forward into their inheritance as well. Okay, the word of your testimony is a powerful weapon. So here are some things that are not our weapon against weapons against a lying and manipulative en- enemy. Number one, lying and manipulation. <laughs> it's not. It's not our weapon. Galatians five fifteen talks about that. That's not our weapon. That's their weapon, and they can have it, and it will consume them. Number two, actual weapons. Not, not one of our weapons, actual weapons. Not, I'm not saying that there's not just wars, there's not a time to fight. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that that's not our primary weapon. That's not the spiritual weapons. You can't fight a spiritual weapon, a spiritual war with physical weapons. Amen. Number three, complaining, not one of our weapons. This is a go-to for a lot of people. It doesn't help. Now look, you can share your need. You can share what you're believing for and how you feel like God would have you pray for that. But moaning about it isn't what you're called to, okay? That won't win. So again, focusing on what our weapons are, spirit-led prayers, worship, the word of God, the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony. So go on the offensive and win some battles. Verse 16, finally... Pilate handed him over to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side of Jesus and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the, sign, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests and the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Yeah. Now this is written by Pilate to be an insult to the Jews. Amen. Look at your king. Powerless. Crucified. Right? That's your king. The Jews take it as an insult. They're thinking just as worldly as Pilate is about this thing, okay? But here's the irony. John the apostle shares this with us as a badge of honor for Jesus. (laughs) Because this is on brand for Jesus. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. He flipped the power structures on their head. He said, whoever wants to be first is going to be last. You're going to be the servant of all. Right? And so John's like, look at this badge of honor, the crucified king. It's powerful. And that imagery is at the center of the gospel. Right? The picture of King Jesus, willingly powerless, crucified is at the center of the gospel. This was the prophetic picture that Pilate unwittingly facilitated. It echoes the Old Testament lamb who was slain for sins, right? Or the Passover lamb who was slain so the firstborn didn't, weren't killed and the blood was put on the doorpost. It echoes the lamb of God who was who is slain, who comes, shows up in Revelation and breaks open the seals to set everything in motion for the end of time, right? The slain lamb. And this picture is at the center of the gospel. And I want you to see this because Jesus was willingly powerless. 
He was willingly crucified. He was the spotless lamb, the one who never sinned, taking the sin that you and I could never pay for. Now you and I can have a home in heaven. Now his blood covers all of our sin when we receive him as Lord and Savior. Say yes to Jesus. Receive him as Lord and Savior. I told you earlier, I watched, uh, I was just, I felt like the Lord wanted me to watch Passion of the Christ movie again. And um, I needed to let it sink in. I needed to feel that again. And, and it leaves you in this like emotional hole. <laughs> just being honest, you know, anyone who's seen it, you know what I'm talking about. You're like, Wait, we sat, the first time I saw it in theater, I just sat in the theater for like past the credits. Everybody else had left. They're trying to clean up the theater for the next crew and I'm just sobbing like, what did I just watch? But we have to understand the prophetic destiny of what Jesus went through and in each of those beatings and each of the different things, because there's like multiple different beatings that are described throughout Scripture from um, with the Jewish guards to the Roman guards to the, to the uh, <clears throat> crown of thorns to the, the flogging to the cat of nine tails to the dragging the cross through the streets <clears throat> and up to the hill to the crucifixion itself to on the cross to all the insults that were given to him to the two uh, thieves who were crucified on either side of him, <clears throat> to his even watching his family endure the suffering that he was enduring. You don't think he felt that? You know he felt that. We're going to see how he felt that in a second, but look, all of those things were weighing on him. And when you experience him again in kind of that, that level of detail, um, it puts in perspective your suffering. It gives you perspective on how God can give you even more grace. That you can go from glory to glory, even in the middle of suffering. Verse 23 it says, when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, each one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining, this garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Now here's the point. Even your mortal enemies are just puppets in God's master plan. Like they're think, they think they're ruining you. They think they're doing things to you. But God is the one who's orchestrating all of it for his glory and your good. Right? They can't stop God's plan in your life. They can only fulfill it. There are prophetic certainties. There are destinies. There are inheritances that God has determined for you. And you have to walk in them. Okay? It may take you a little longer than you thought at first. It may take you a little longer than you, maybe even the Lord thought at first. Well, they're taking a little longer. But you're going to walk. There's a trajectory you got to walk with the Lord into peace, into joy, Amen. into love, into faithfulness, into rightness with him. Verse 25. Near the cross stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Now, here's the, here's the hardest part of suffering many times for us humans. Now, obviously, Jesus had the greater part of taking the whole sin of the whole world on him. That's different for us. Often the hardest part of suffering is that your suffering affects those you love. Amen. Your suffering affects others, and that can be the hardest part. Jesus experienced this too. 
And he was taking this very seriously in this moment. Um, he's taking responsibility for caring for his mother, okay, just like a firstborn son should. And he knows his other siblings are jokers at this time. Like, he knows his other siblings aren't going to handle it. Like, there's literally a, couple, a few months earlier, his, his brothers came to him and tried to goad him to go to Jerusalem so he would get himself killed. Yeah. It's literally what they're telling him. They weren't, they weren't good disciples. They weren't following him. They weren't righteous people. They weren't even good guys. Now, all that turned around when they saw Jesus raised from the dead, and now we have the book of James and Jude to account for that because those guys turned it all around, all right? But they were not equipped to take on and take care of Jesus' mother. So John, his disciple, is given that responsibility. So Jesus understands that kind of suffering. He understands that your hurt, your pain, your grief, your incapacity at times affects very deeply those you love and care about. So, and this is why we're called to pray for God's best. This is why we're called to pray for healing, you know, physical healing, emotional healing, uh, all kinds of different relational healing. That's why we're called to believe for God's best because what if it's not just about you? Amen. What if your healing is there to facilitate something for someone else? Amen. Okay, so prayers for healing aren't even selfish when you are willing to steward that thing well and steward that testimony well and be able to gift that back to the people in your life. So take care of those around you. Learn to suffer gracefully. Watch how Jesus endures suffering. This is master class, verse 28. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, again, what's not present in Jesus' suffering, one is complaining, we talked about that already, too, is blaming. He, he doesn't blame people. He asks God to forgive them. He doesn't blame God. He sets himself to finish the work that God set out for him. He doesn't move toward bitterness in this moment, even though he, could, he has every reason to do so. Everything that was done to him was completely unjust. He doesn't escape although he has the power to do so. Amen. Could have called down a legion of angels and in an instant be rescued, but he does not, and he doesn't, he doesn't complain. I want the musicians to come forward. Um, there's some things that we need to get, though, before we go into communion tonight. Because we're called to identify with the sufferings of Jesus, and that's part of the Christian life, and particularly what communion teaches us to do. So, how Jesus faces suffering next is he faces suffering resolute and determined. You see him, you see how determined he is in these moments? All right. Uh, you see him keeping his integrity. You see him facing it responsibly and you see him focused on God's word. The resolute and determinedness. Jesus knows what he has to face and he's intent on facing it with honor. Amen. Right? There's this almost stoic rightness to Jesus' reactions here. Now, you can feel his emotions. You know, it's not stoic in the sense of not emotional. He's very much responding to the things that are happening in emotional ways, but he's determined to stay true in suffering. Jesus faces the suffering, and he faces the suffering keeping his integrity as well. The integrity of every other single human around him is breaking down. His enemy's integrity was always a joke. His friend's integrity runs away at the first sight of trouble. His loved one's integrity, his family's integrity was long gone except maybe Mary's. But Jesus is here. Though none go with me, still I will follow. And of course, that song is about us following Jesus. In this case, it's Jesus following the master's plan, following his father's plan. Right? He's resolute. He's determined to keep his integrity. And you and I can keep our integrity in suffering too. 
And I'd encourage you, if and where it's broken down at points, reestablish it. Get back on the horse. Commit to integrity from this moment forward. Next, Jesus faces suffering responsibly. He's been preparing his followers for this moment. He's, he's responsible to prepare them over the course of years. He's been telling them, hey, look, I'm not going to be with you all the time. I'm going away to the Father. It's good that I go away because another one has to come. You need the Holy Spirit. He tells them plainly, he's like, look, I'm, they're going to crucify me, and then <laughs> I'm going to rise again in three days, and, but I'm not going to always be with you. He's preparing them. He's preparing them. He's preparing them where I'm going God's going to prepare a place for you, but you're going to be without me for a while. So he doesn't want to leave them wandering and helpless. He's giving them all these prophetic cues, all these prophetic Easter eggs that they need to find. And they don't understand most of them. Like right out the gate, they're kind of like just blinded to most of what he's saying. Like they took it in, they heard it, but then they were like, I don't know what that means. Because they couldn't imagine the eventualities that had to take place that were the Passion Week. They couldn't imagine that that would be possible. Once that happened, all of these prophetic declarations that Jesus had made for years now were coming to their minds, coming to their minds. They're like, oh yeah, this is what he said. This is what he meant. This fulfills this prophecy. This fulfills this thing. And all of a sudden, there was this prophetic trajectory that was blooming in the minds and hearts of the disciples. And that's how Jesus works. Sometimes he plants seeds that you don't understand the seed, but hold on to the seed. Water that seed. Understand that it's going to produce fruit. You don't know the, uh, the, the passion week that's going to get you to that kind of fruit. But be patient and see the fruit because there are prophetic certainties that are on the other side of that passion. There are prophetic certainties that are on the other side of that suffering if you're willing to lean into and tend to those seeds. So he faces it responsibly. He takes care of his mother responsibly. Jesus focused on God's words in these moments. He says, I am thirsty to fulfill the scripture, John says. So even in his last breaths, he's focused on God's word and the fulfillment of prophecy and proving God right when he speaks. His final quotation, his final words are quotation from Psalm 22. It is finished. It's the last words of Psalm 22 that begins, my God, my God, my, why have you forsaken me? It ends, it is finished. It's completely finished. It's fulfilled. So focusing on God's word and suffering keeps your focus away from the pain of suffering. It keeps your focus off of those who hurt you. You don't have to focus on them. You focus on God's words. It makes God bigger in your life and it gives you eternal perspective. All of those things need to become a habit in your life throughout before you hit suffering. Because if it's a habit, that'll carry you through the suffering. Focusing on God's words. The bottom line, as we go into communion, that we have to realize is this. Enduring through suffering well determines the level of your victory on the other side. Look, I've been that guy who's walked through a hard season of life and caved to just being a dork about it and complaining and arguing, and fighting, and striving, trying to do everything in my own strength, trying to get even. And when I got on the other side of that suffering, got on the other side of that hurt, I hobbled along And I, and I went three steps forward and two steps back and two steps forward and three steps back and just kept living and it didn't produce any good in my life. But there's times when you face suffering like Jesus did and you begin to be resolute in it. When you focus on God's word in it, 
when you're graceful, grace-filled in it. When you don't say, you know what? It's not time for complaining. It's time to be responsible in suffering. It's time to, even though it hurts, to focus on what God has next, to declare God's words in my life. And what's, what's possible on the other side of that passion is a resurrection, is a restitution, where you get paid back with interest for all the hurt that happened in your life. That the pains that, and the wounds not only get healed, but those scars become a sign for the rest of the people in your life that God is good. And they begin to, to step into your victory. Enduring through suffering well in the way that Jesus did, the way that Jesus patterned for us and did this master class in it, forgiving, determines the level of victory on the other side. And some of you needed to hear that this week. Some of you need to pull yourself into a better space this week and commit this week. Jesus, I'm gonna face it just a little more like you did. So we're gonna take communion today. I, I, before we do, one more thing. There's a place in the Lord where you're enduring through suffering well that will make all of the suffering worth it. Even while we're on the earth. Look, it'll definitely be worth it in heaven. 100%. But there is a place in the Lord where the victory is such that it could be worth it even now. I want you all to stand with me. We're going to identify with the suffering of Jesus with communion today. Um, there's communion in the back and in the front. So if you're toward the back of the room, your communion is behind you. Everyone go to the center aisles and come down. Take the elements with you back to your seats around the side aisles. That'll keep our traffic flow a little bit better. You guys can do that right now. I trust, but take an intentional moment with the Lord. If you're a believer, we have an open communion meeting that if you're a full and believer, uh, you should 
take communion with us. Um, if you're not full in follower of Christ, please don't, um, because there's judgment that could take place in your life if you don't take this in a worthy manner, the scripture says. The Bible says that everyone who, per, who, who takes and partakes in communion should prepare their hearts. So examine your heart right now. God, examine my heart right now. God, I thank you that your sacrifice means that I don't have to be chained to sin. I don't have to be chained to my old way of life. But God, I am brand new because of the spirit, the pure spotless lamb and the blood of Jesus. Take the bread with me now. Jesus, we remember your body that was broken. God, your hands that were pierced with nails, your feet, your side that was pierced, God, your body that was beaten. And God, we identify with your suffering right now. God, remembering your sacrifice. God, that your sacrifice is effective in our lives right now. Let's take the bread together. We declare that we are part of the body of Christ as we partake in the representation of the body of Christ. Take the cup now, represents the blood of Jesus, that although it's red, spiritually it washes us clean, whiter than snow, the scripture says, from all sin, from all shame, from all fear, it washes us clean. So God, we receive that cleanness tonight as we take the cup and declare your death until you come again. In Jesus' name, let's take the cup together. bless you, God. Let's sing that chorus one more time. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love you. Yes, we do. We love you, God. Oh, how we love you. You are the one. You are the one. Our hearts adore. Yes, you are. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. Jesus, we do love you. We identify with your suffering tonight in a way that we believe will set us on a, tr- a prophetic course for victory and so God I thank you for your suffering I thank you for the cross pray that we would realize the value of the gospel in our lives in such greater ways in Jesus name amen amen thank you so much for being with us tonight Um, it is not too late to invite somebody to Easter in fact it's probably just on time Uh, God bless you as you go. Happy Good Friday.